We came here, a bunch of us, to help to transition this planet from the darkness that's taken it over to the light. The dark has only succeeded by secrecy and deception and control. You know, they've tried to poison us and our air, our water, our soil, our minds, you know, the, the vaccines, the pharmaceuticals. So that shows me that we're inherently very, very powerful. Before we get into today's conversation, I'd like to offer a trigger warning. Today's guest was trained as a child, and this is probably the most heavy and disturbing conversation I've had with anyone as she goes into some detail of the rituals that were performed on her as a child. So I just want you guys to be aware before getting into today's interview that it could be very disturbing for some people. So Max, would you like to start by just giving us a background on what happened to you as a child? Hmm. Sure. Um, my Because of my father's job, he was in the Foreign Service. Um, I grew up in five countries moving you know, every couple of years of my childhood. Um, my mom is Italian and... Um, so I grew up trilingual, Italian, English, and Spanish. And it was the kind of lifestyle with really nice homes and, uh, you know, cooks and nannies and chauffeurs that took us to the private schools and, and that kind of thing. And my grandfathers were ambassadors. And so I was often at cocktail parties with, you know, VIP people and that kind of thing. Um, so on on that aspect of my life, it was somewhat of a privileged lifestyle. Um, on the other hand, um, my Italian uncle um, ran a secret underground uh, facility in the outskirts of Rome, um, and these they're under it was underground and huge, like several city blocks. And um, in these kinds of places, they exist actually everywhere in the world. Um, you know, they engage in torture and in experiments, and they had a lot of technology. So things you may have heard like MK Ultra programming and things like that. Um, so unfortunately, uh, I was targeted pretty much after birth. And when I lived in the different countries, Sometimes he would come there and do things sometimes, but every summer and every winter holiday, my mother would take us to Rome. And then when I was 14, uh, after we lived in Argentina, my parents divorced. And then uh, unfortunately I moved to Rome full time where he had more access to me. And so I was put through kind of, anything you can imagine that falls under the umbrella. And if you want, I can be more specific. And I was tracked, um, with it within the Italian elite and through the Vatican. And um, I was also put through satanic rituals, which uh, the Vatican also does. And so I also witnessed um, child sacrifice there. Uh, so that's kind of a little bit of a nutshell, and I'll I'll let you ask me anything more specific. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I I would like to hear any more specific details that you would like to share. I know when I listened to some of your other interviews, you talked about how the people involved you believed were definitely um, I don't know if you use the word possessed, but they had more demonic and were doing things that human beings could never do to one another? Yes, I, I think that's actually really important for people to begin to know and understand because the way we've been raised in this society, we're told that, that that's not real, it's fantasy, you know, but it, it is very real. So to back up a step, I, from my experience and knowledge and research and um, communication with my higher self, I, m what I uh, know to be true 
is that there, the people that run this world, the so-called elite, they're psychopaths, uh, they're Satanists, and they're pedophiles. And so a lot of them, if not all of them, have they do rituals to bring in demonic entities into this plane, but also into their own bodies um, to take the place of their organic soul. And so they're psychopaths because they're now disconnected from God's source and they're inhabited by a, a, a negative demonic entity. So that's just to describe um, kind of that a little bit. And I actually saw that myself um, my uncle's facility was connected by an underground train to the sub levels of the Vatican. People may not know that they have these levels way underground, but they do. Um, there's a room that has a big throne to Satan under there. And then there's a room that I was taken to where they have altars. And um, this is difficult, but they bring in children, babies, toddlers, and then the the is collected in these chalices at the corners of the altar. And those participants that are there will drink the blood. Sometimes they'll pluck out the organs and eat them. And, you know, this is all in ritual fashion with candles and things. And I have witnessed it, it to me, what I can, the way I can describe it is it's a, it's a cold that's beyond any cold you can imagine that fills the room. And then you can actually see kind of a smoky kind of shape. And so I've seen people, um, as you say, be possessed, that's a good word for it, basically, but willingly invite these entities to inhabit them. Um, these people basically, because they're disconnected to God and they, they worship Satan, for them, what's important is worldly power, fame, wealth, control, and they see us as a lesser species. Um, they see us as slaves, as cattle. Um, these folks, you know, people probably have heard of the bloodline families. Um, they're hybrid descendants from, and, and this is gonna get a little woo woo, but from uh, other races that have come to this planet and taken it over that are darker races. And so, yeah, so I'll let, I'll leave it there. and see if you have any other questions about that. Yeah. Once again, thank you for sharing. I, I mean, I know this is not easy to talk about. Um, I think probably the number one question that people watching may have is, and, and I don't even know if there's an answer to this question that we can wrap our minds around, but why would God allow this type of suffering, this level of suffering to happen here? Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> That's a question I've asked myself, but so let me muddle through what I've sort of pondered. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was a little girl, I could see, I was telepathic. So I had the abilities that I believe we all come in with, but are sort of, mm, you know, turned off as we're enter this system. Some people have called it a hell or a prison planet or that kind of stuff. Um, but when I was a child, I could see a veil over the earth, a gray veil. And so that was put there by the dark forces. And um, maybe you know this or maybe you don't, but for a long time, um, there was forced reincarnation because people would leave, would die, leave their bodies. And instead of going back to God's source, this thing that was overlaid would recycle them back along with all their traumas. And so this was done to harvest us. And because the more traumatized and fragmented beings are, the easier they are to mind control. And, you know, that's unfortunately something that's been done to all of us. So um, when I came in as a child, I was still very I was very connected and I, my feeling was like, oh my God, what is this place? It's so dark. It's so dense. So I don't exactly remember where I came from, but it, it was completely different than here. And so I had this sense that um, actually when I was about five and I was living in Africa, I had a vision of a bunch of 
stars like souls coming to this planet as a group. And I consider that the the it's the crystalline energy souls, the Christed souls, you know, it's we came here, a bunch of us, to help to transition this planet from the darkness that's taken it over to the light. So I know I'm kind of going roundabout, but that's just to say when I came in, I was very aware that something was awry here. And, you know, then I was put through just horrific things. And, but I always, sur I survived because I remembered that someday I'll meet some of these other beings that came here and we can do something about this issue. So I think one answer to it is we don't, you know, there's some kind of contract when you come here where you don't remember, like you're, you're, you have to sort of wipe that connection and be human fully, and then maybe find it again in your lifetime. So one answer is I don't know because I can't remember that aspect of it very well. But um, I think it has something to do with, well, there's definitely free will here. And it has something to do with finding our power and our sovereignty and who we truly are, because the dark has only succeeded by secrecy and deception and control. You know, they've tried to poison us and our air, our water, our soil, our minds, you know, the, the vaccines, the pharmaceuticals. So that shows me that we're inherently very, very powerful. And so maybe there's a, uh, some opportunity for us to it, let, and I'm not saying it is this way, but let's say it's a, it's a video game or a game, right? Maybe we come here and, and the odds are really stacked against us. And maybe our souls want to see how can we find ourselves again? And how can we find love and compassion in such a hellscape that we incarnate in? So is there something to that? Um, you know, the creator of the I am, the God source is everything. So that includes the darkness. So is, is that um, an aspect of, you know, did God create light and darkness to see kind of how that balance can play out and the darkness did sort of take over? So I don't have a clear answer because sometimes in my despair, I've said, yeah, like WTF God, like what, you know, what is this? But I have to allow for the fact that I'm in a human body right now and there's pieces of information that I don't have. But what I can sort of sum it up with is I was put through hell. I mean, I was tortured by electric shock and um, um, being alive with disease, with being simulated drowning, um, you know, being nailed to crosses, watching animals be tortured and killed, watching people be tortured and killed, you know, put through gang rapes and forced abortions and horrific stuff like that, which people think couldn't possibly be, but it is. And so if I went through all that and I was able to heal and recover myself. And I'm at the point in my life where I'm trying to do something about this by speaking out, then that is something, right? That looks like God in action. So we can overcome it. And a lot of we are, I believe right now, I believe this is the most pivotal time in the history of this, of, of the planet in its entirety, where we're going to choose to go from where we've been towards a, a whole new earth, a, you know, towards the light. And then the last thing I'll say is, you know, we're souls and our souls are never affected and our souls never die. And I've been, I've died many times and then come back into my body. So I can tell you, I never stopped existing, not even for one second. I was just either in my body or out of it and, and, you know, talking with other entities. So in a way, you know, if you zoom out, it's, you know, it's okay. And so that's kind of, I know that's not a direct answer, but that's kind of what I've pondered about all of this. Thank you. I really, really appreciated hearing your perspective on that. And I noticed that you said for a while there was forced reincarnation. And I've heard that from a couple of other, um, I think it's a couple 
between life regressionist I spoke with that said that was going on for a while and and they said that it had then stopped but what's your perspective on that is that something that's still going on or has it stopped it has stopped um and the and I can only tell you that sometimes I see things and so in maybe 10 years ago I saw the veil had a lot of holes in it like swiss cheese mm-hmm. And recently in the last, maybe, I don't know, I don't know exactly, but in the last span of maybe five years, maybe a little more, the veil is not there. I don't, Mm -hmm. it's gone. And I can feel that it's not there. And so that means that now when people leave, they will be reunited with God's source and cleansed and healed, which is how it was meant to be, right? So part Mm -hmm. of the Part of the the reason why people are so mind controlled and so obedient of authority and so apathetic is because they've not only been traumatized heavily in this lifetime, because you can't really exist here and not be traumatized. It's, it's a continuum, right? right? Maybe I'm over here, but everybody has trauma. So, you know, the, the forced reincarnation was just another way to keep traumatized people coming back. So you don't have a chance to cleanse and heal. So it was just another devious trick to control us and keep us powerless. Mm-hmm. But that has shifted. Yes, I do believe that so. So you mentioned that you had some out-of-body experiences. And I remember in a previous interview, you talked about seeing Jesus Christ. Some of those times you were out of body. Would you like to share about that? Sure. Um, it was actually every time. Um when I was a child, even when I was being um, tortured, like I was put in these, they're kind of like isolation boxes where there's no light and you can't, you, you can't tell how much time is passing or whatnot. And I would be put in there for long periods of time. Or when I was in cages, um, I would be, I would leave this dimension and I would be with Jesus. And I was I was very fond of animals like dolphins and elephants and lions. And so I would I would be in a natural setting with the animals and with Jesus and we would walk and talk. So even when I was alive, I was very connected. And that is some of how I got through what I got through. Um, But when I would die, um, I would leave my body and the feeling was like a shriek of joy and expansion. It was like <gasps> freedom, just like not in this tiny little vessel. And and then he would be right there. And um, I would always be given the choice to not return if I didn't want to. But he would show me timelines and like it, it's like a hologram of reality. And what difference it would make if I was here and I wasn't. And that sounds a little bit arrogant, right? Because like, I'm just one person, but actually each and every one of us is that important here. Um, it, we have different things that strengths or whatever. And so he would show me that and I would always choose to come back. And then when I would come back, it was it was a really awful feeling to like squeeze back into the body and it's so dark. And then this dimension is so dark. And I don't know if this makes sense, but when you're not in your body, you're much more, you're like, oh, I'll go there. I'll I'll do it. (laughs) You know, and then when you're in the body, you're like, what was I thinking? No, no, no. You know, so it's really hard in this dimension. On the other hand, I don't know, this planet is so beautiful. It's spring now here, you know, where I am. And just the, the the flowers and the trees and the green. And so I think we want to experience, that's another reason we come to experience everything, you know, the feeling of water, uh, being able to have a physical component to love, right? Um, you know, all the things that we can do here. So, um, but yes, yeah, so every time I was not in the body, I would choose to come back. And then Sometimes and then when I would come back, I would be angry and feel like <laughs> I shouldn't have come back. Um, but I think probably a lot of people feel that way. I remember hearing you talk about how after you had these experiences with Jesus, you were at a Catholic church. I don't remember all the details, but mm-hmm. they were giving communion and you recognized 
the satanic rituals and you had this um this message from jesus about i i understand what what you're going through because they did it to me too could you share about that experience yeah when i was probably around five or six it suddenly clicked to me because, you know, we go to church every Sunday and take communion. Well, you don't take communion yet till you're a little older, but I noticed, wait a minute, they're saying they're eating the body and drinking the blood of Christ. And I saw they, them do that with ch underneath the Vatican. So I recognized, and I mean, I was taken to the Vatican a lot, horrible things done to me. So I was very aware that they pretend to be of God but they're really not, you know, I mean, you can't, you can't be there and then hear this is, oh, the Pope and the church. And so I knew that wasn't true. And um, I observed things that I, that aligned with Satanism. So they pretend to be of God, but from my experience, they're not. And when I was about two, I was living in Chile at that time, and um, my uncle did a ritual where um, it was a, a small church and my family was sitting in the pews and they put me on the altar of the church and um, took a metal cross and heated it up and laid it on my chest so that it burned me. They put me in a little coffin on there and then put the lid on and left me there overnight. And the whole ritual was like to... Uh, you know, bind me to to Satan and all this stuff, but also to separate me from my family. It was like, you know, so there were so many rituals that my uncle did that were um, Jesus-like rituals that it was, a, I knew that it was a mockery of who the real Jesus was. Um, so, yeah. So in your experience, who is the real Jesus? Is is there any truth to anything that we're told in religion? Like, for instance, with his sacrifice on the cross. I've, I've, it's been pointed out that that's more of like a satanic ritual itself. But what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think we can look at things from many perspectives, and I don't claim to have the absolute truth. So let me just put that out there. Um, but there is this thing where the sign of the cross, you touch your pineal gland, your third eye, then you touch your heart, and then you bind them, right? So that is, so, you know, every time the, the Satanists get us to do their rituals unwittingly, thinking we're doing a good thing, like communion. And that's another thing. Every time people do that sign of the cross, they're binding themselves, Um in Mecca, where they have this giant black cube and the worshipers uh, walk in a circle around it and they chant and pray, that cube is a satanic symbol, unbeknownst to them. And so they're creating a vortex when they go around it and their, their, their energy is being harvested for the dark. So our energies get harvested um, by the satanic elite. Um, in terms of Jesus, um, I don't know if he died on the cross or not, but he, I believe he came here to fight this darkness and to expose the satanic system has been here a long time. And I think he came to sort of try and expose that and remind people who we truly are, right? So when he did, I believe in these miracles he did are actually things we can all do. And he said that, right? So when he made many loaves of bread, that's manifesting. And so he had, obviously, he had his abilities that we all have as a birthright, but we, we have to develop them in this reality. So I think it was an advanced soul, and he came here to expose that and to spread love and truth. You know, I, I believe that he was married. I, from the research I've done, I think Mary Magdalene was his wife and that he actually had children. Um, so I'm not sure about the crucifixion, uh, if that's true or not. Um, but it certainly looks to me like a mockery of Jesus by the Satanists. So they're torturing him and they bind him on a cross. And then that's the symbol they show. Like, 
if you think about it, if you're going to church, why not show a beautiful image of Jesus alive? Why that one, right? So I think um, he was a real person that was here and he had that Christ energy that I'm talking about. So that's kind of as far as I've gotten um, with with that. But I still have, you know, some people talk to their guides, some people talk to, to you know, whatever. I still talk to Jesus. So for whatever reason, that is the person that is my comfort and and um, guide and, and that kind of thing. And I'm not religious. So let me emphasize that. I do not believe in religion. I think religion sandwiches itself between us and God. Um, and it's the satanic thing of just, it's taking something that's true. This doesn't mean a lot of the things in religion aren't true, but there's just enough of a twist and an inversion to, you know, like they say, to look to the authority out here. When Jesus himself said, God is within you, look within, right? So I, I don't subscribe to religion, but I do subscribe to Jesus and God. Thank you for sharing that. That was going to be my next question because you've shared how some of these religious rituals that we do in different religions, we may be allowing the satanic groups to harvest our energy unbeknownst to us. And I also, another thing that interested me is in another interview, if I understood you correctly, I heard you talking about meditation and how that could also give away some of our energy. I'd love to hear your thoughts on meditation specifically. And I was also going to ask you, is there like a direct spiritual route that we can take to get to God without going down any of these side trails? So with meditation, um, I believe it is important and, and you can call it meditation or you can call it just sitting still or connecting. Um, when, when we're in our daily lives, we're in a frequency called beta, which is great for getting things done. But we naturally have built into us cycles where we were supposed to cycle into other frequencies like theta or alpha or or there's other ones that go even deeper. So how do you how are you gonna connect? You have to be still. Um, and then the mind is there. It can be a trickster. It can be a monkey. You know, there's a lot, a lot of thoughts. And if you have a lot of trauma, then you have a lot of negative thoughts. So we're taught to not to to favor the mind, but it's really the heart that's the main part, and it has to be connected to the mind and go together. So I think on a personal level, to sit and 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 meditate, where you just breathe deeply and you're just in the present moment and you're open to hearing and receiving from that those higher dimensions that's a good thing when they get people to do mass meditations that can be and most always is a harvesting and it's dangerous because the people go in it with the right intentions but their energy and their goodwill is being channeled to the dark. Um, just as a little side note, there's a lot of entities that feed off our frequency, right? And it, it's called louche, if you've ever heard that word. I have. So they, the, the people that run the world keep us in low frequency deliberately, scared, you know, full of shame and anger and guilt because that is a frequency bandwidth that the demonic and discarnate demonic entities will feed on. So that is a real thing. They feed off our energy and our light. So I would not participate in a mass meditation because I would not but want to be loosed and harvested. Um, and then remind me the second part of your question. Yeah, I was going to ask you if there's a direct path we can get oh. to to God without going down the, you know, these doing these religious rituals. Yes. In fact, I'm going to say the religious rituals are most of them are not are designed to take us away from that. Um, and it's really simple. The answer is we all have this ability organically. Um, what will mess with that ability is trauma, um, low frequency mental states or emotional states, 
and, you know, being misinformation and all this other, this idea that we have to look out here to somehow do that. So I think that is just the most natural organic part of us. We are souls in a physical vessel and we just, so if the soul is, you know, huge, there's a little portion in here so we can connect to that. Um, and we have that ability and it just takes cleaning up the things that are blocking that communication. You know, it's it, like any other communication. If the line is clear, it's easy and it's direct. So I think that's why I advocate for healing. Do your shadow work. We all have traumas, heal your traumas. And then, you know, learn to love again, love yourself, love others. And when you're in that frequency bandwidth, you, it's automatic to connect. And I like um, David Hawkins' uh, chart of consciousness. So when you're up in, he, he calls the upper layer, I think the spiritual uh, something. And so that's how you connect easily. You get yourself back up to that level and it's automatic and organic. It is our birthright to connect. I also love his scale of consciousness. Um, so one more question about this topic and then we'll move on. Um, but you mentioned mass meditation and how that could potentially be dangerous. Is that like any group meditation? Like say you're doing a group meditation with your friends or I've done meditations on my channel before to try to just get people connected and meditating together. Are those things dangerous or is this a specific type of mass meditation? Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked that clarifying question. No, if you're doing it with your group of people and they're, you're all on the same page and it, what it was so important is your intent, right? So you're setting the intent as a spiritual person. So that's, that's okay. Because like that saying, when two or more are gathered in my name, right? It's, it's more powerful, especially so people have done that and they call it prayer, but people have gotten together and focused healing energy on someone who's sick and that person will heal. Right. And um, there's doctors uh, that I've seen uh, work. It's not very well known, but who do basically what they call psychic surgery and it's the same principle. They will like look at a tumor and, and, and send it, you know, focus on it and, and it can actually dissolve it and heal it without needing to cut the body. So in that vein, yes, it's useful. You just have to be careful who you're doing these mass meditations with because there's a lot of false light out there, a lot. And that's um, unfortunately the new age program, although it contains some truths, steers people into a false light idea. And that's those groups will harness um, energy and and use it for ill. And we're trained to think certain people like the Pope is good or the Dalai Lama is good. And unfortunately, they're not. They're actually posing as light beings, but they're they're dark beings. So that's where you have to be careful. Okay. So who's doing the meditation? Who are they? Right. That makes sense. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, how you got out of these satanic circles and your healing journey with that. You know, um, there was a moment um, when I was about 17 where um, my uncle was having me do, he loved to do uh, Jesus rituals. And in this case, it was, it was less horrific and more just that I was supposed to carry this heavy cross in a, in a circle in an outdoor area that we were at. There was like an old stone house there. And he had my sister, my younger sister there. And at that point, I was so sick and tired of all of this. Like, I know that sounds crazy, but you can kind of get sick of evil. Like it's, it's scary and terrifying and horrifying, but there's also a moment where I just had been put through so much. So... I had sort of, I had sort of said to him, like, as long as you leave my sister and my mother alone, you know, it's almost like I was, I was going to go along with it. So I was carrying this cross around and I looked up and he had hung from a tree by her ankle. And um, they, they like to hang people upside down, by the way, and swing you around. And it's a whole nother thing. So 
I became enraged and I just stopped and something came over me and I, my anger was so great that I could feel like a little bit of wind starting up, like the, the dust was circling in a sort of vortex. And I, I was suddenly like, I had all this power came in me and it's almost like a different voice. And I, I just, I, I had it. I just said, that's it. No more. I'm done. You're not going to touch me anymore. You're not going to touch them. This is over. And, and just this thing came out of me. And I said, you know, because you know what I can do, like, I'm not going to have this anymore. I am done. I just said no. And then after that, I mean, he didn't do any more of the rituals. He came to my high school graduation and gave me a photograph um, and said that, you know, I could leave, but I could never really leave and, and this kind of thing. So he tried. But what I'm trying to say is, and I think this applies to each and every one of us, when you step into your power and you say no to evil, you are more powerful than them. So evil has done a lot on this planet, but partially because of our consent, even if it's just implied consent, if you don't say no, it's implied consent, right? And so I think I got to a point where I, maybe God put that knowledge in me, like maybe I had a contract, maybe I, I was, you know, I came here to be in these dark places or whatnot, but at some point I said no. And that was really the pivotal moment when it was over. Now, my father's American and I was always meant to come to university in the States. So even though I never really lived here growing up, that was a thing. And so when I graduated high school in Italy, I, I did come over here. And so that was another factor that, you know, he didn't really have access to me anymore then. And but but I did want to emphasize that I just said no. I was just like, that's it. It's done. And so, you know, I came over here to the States and I went to school and, you know, I, I did therapy and I um, I worked in trauma and helped a lot of people, which was part of my therapy. So um, and I can go more into that, but I'll, I'll just stop here for now. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. So you came to the States to go to university and. I'm sure it was probably a long process of healing. I remember that hearing you talk about how you just had rage come up and you had to take up boxing. And I can't even imagine the level of anger that you must have felt over everything you had gone through. But I wanted to ask you, how do you work through those emotions? Yeah. Well, so when I first came to the States and went to school, I was 18. And so pretty much my 20s and most of my 30s, I was just, I had been so, I wanted to live life because I had not been able to live a normal life or have a normal childhood. So God always does everything the exact way that we need it. So during that time, I was going to school. I was, I had friends. I was, you know, um, working and I, I had to have some life and just be done with that. And I didn't want to have anything to do with those experiences. So I, I just threw myself into life and I suppressed it. I repressed it. I didn't want to, I just wanted to be normal and live. So there was a period of that. Um, even in that period, there was healing because my ability to help, and I worked in the prisons and in the inner city and with crisis centers and that kind of thing. So my ability to help people was part of my healing. So there was still healing happening. And I did go into therapy, but I didn't access some of those deeper repressed memories until at some point I, I got pregnant and I got married and I had my daughter. And then when she was about four years old, um, the vault just opened. And so the memories really, so I, I knew what was happening because I'm, you know, I'm trained psychotherapist. So I got help and the memories, that's the way it happened for me. They just started coming out and pouring out. And then all these pieces of my life started to fit and make sense. And during this process, that's when the rage came out. Um, so I would, I would remember things. I would have nightmares where I would wake up screaming and I would have sweated out the whole bed. 
by the time I was done with therapy, I had to throw out that mattress. Um, but they were actually memories coming back through nightmares. And then I would have them during the day too. And so I released a lot of emotions, um, cried, screamed, all that. And then that's when the rage really just was like there. And so I wasn't being very nice to the people around me because I just had all this rage, understandably. And I noticed it. So I took up boxing, which I still do. I do kickboxing now. And that ability to fight when I couldn't as a child, you know, when there were horrible men on top of me, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't fight. So it was so important as part of the healing to be able to, the body to do what it couldn't do. Um, and then, so I, I I did that. And, you know, I, I don't claim to be fully healed yet today. I think it's a lifelong process, but I've learned to observe my thoughts. So what am I thinking? Um, what am I acting from? So I'm always self-observing. What am I thinking? Am I feeling anything in my body? Um, do I have a sensation here or there? Or what emotional state am I in? And I use being triggered as a as a healing. So it's my it's my belief that when we get triggered, something happens in the present reality and it it opens up a, a timeline to the past. It's kind of like when you have a video, you know, you can watch a scene, you can rewind to an old scene. Time is not linear. It's everything is at once, but we experience it that way. So when you get triggered, it takes you back to the original wound. Whatever the trigger is, it has a thread that goes to something already existing in us. And so the opportunity there, and that's what I've learned to do, is to sit with, so I sit with it. I sit with the pain and the feeling and I breathe and I just, and if I have to cry or scream, I do. And then I find the 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 mental thing, like what is it? What did I believe? What did you know? What happened? And then I ask God to let it go, to take it from me, to heal it from me. So I intentionally ask for healing. And so I've done that every time I've gotten triggered. And then what I've noticed in my life is less and less things trigger me because I've cleaned that stuff out. The, the what we unfortunately tend to do, and I've done this too is we react. So someone triggers us and without thinking, we just, bah, we react. And it's always an overreaction because the, the depth of the feeling is from the past, right? So then we overreact and then we create harm in another, and then that person may react back and then we create another trauma. So it's really not helpful, but so that's some of the um, things that I do. I also love nature. So I walk, in, I'm fortunate enough to live around a lot of forest. So I walk, I talk to the trees, I talk to the plants. Um, I have pets, I hug them when I feel stressed out. So I'm always trying to be connected to life and love as much as I can. I mean, I fall into states, but it's okay. I just take myself back out and I use it to clean something else out. So I hope I answered that. Okay. Yes. That's thank you so much for sharing that. I know that can be helpful to so many people, no matter what level of trauma they've experienced. You made that really practical. Yeah. I want to just add, you know, we are, we have been victimized but we don't want to stay in a victim identity, mm. right? And that's a huge part of it. A lot of people in the world are, are victim identified and you know you get some goodies from it because you get people to give you things or help you, but you, you know, so it's okay to, when you process your trauma to feel like a victim, but don't stay there. You have to rise above that because we're survivors, we're victors, as a friend of mine calls it. And so that's where we're, we are self-responsible for our own healing. We may have had a really bad childhood, but once we're grown up, it's on us to deal with that and to heal it. And you, you should want to, because then that's freedom internally, right? Otherwise we're trapped by people say, oh, well, that person made me do it. Well, if that person made you do it, then, wow, that's a terrible state to be in because now everybody outside of you can control you and has power over your emotions. No, you know, we need to 
not remain in victim, to, to take responsibility, to do what we can to heal. And, and, you know, sometimes you need help for healing. I mean, I had help and it was very useful and very good. But it's that intent that I'm going to rise and rise and rise to hopefully achieve my fullest potential that I can in this body in this lifetime. That's beautiful. So some people watching this may be thinking um, that they don't, because you mentioned about giving consent by not saying no. And so some people may be wondering, how can I do my part to not be a part of this evil system? What, what do you have any thoughts on what the average person could do to make sure that they're not giving consent and that we're all doing our part to, to take our power back against this system? Well, it's really pretty simple. It, you just say no to something that's immoral and wrong. And if I can use an example, um, during the COVID time, um, people were told, doctors and, and healthcare professionals were told to do certain things to spread, you know, to encourage people to take the shot and all of that. But, and, and so some doctors said, no, I did some research and this is not, this is not healthy. This is not good. Others consented and did things that they knew were wrong. I could say it about what's going on in the school system now where they're sexualizing children. This destroys the child's brain because it's not ready for this level of information, right? And so the teacher, some teachers may believe in the curriculum, but I bet a lot don't. And so if, if you're such a teacher, what's the choice there? Comply because I don't want to lose my job or stand up to what's right and say no. And then there are consequences when you do not consent to immoral and evil things because we live in a world run by these people. So you will get you know, some consequence, but in the, in the end, who are we? We're souls here in a body and like what? So it's like choosing between right and wrong. Really, it's that simple. And I, I am heartened to see, I saw a group of teachers, I don't remember where, who got together and are suing um, because they say they don't want to have to, if, uh, the, the rule for teachers is if a child says that they're questioning their gender, that the teachers cannot tell the parents. And so they made a lawsuit saying, you're forcing us to lie to parents and we don't want to do that. So there's an example of a group of people who chose the right moral action. And it's all about, and even wearing a mask, you know, people complied out of fear. So what if everyone, everyone in the world, when they were told to wear a mask said no? There would have been no mask wearing. Right. What if everyone was told lock down your business? And, and again, only small businesses were locked down, right? Not the big corporate ones. If everyone was told you can't go to work and make money, what if everybody said no? Uh, that would harm me and my family. And I can't do that because it's wrong. It's not necessary. What if everyone said no? The economy wouldn't be in the state it is today. So that's what I mean by implied consent. We have a choice. And, you know, in the, and, and again, I'm not religious, but in the Bible, they talk about the, the day of judgment. Mm -hmm. I kind of think that's right now because evil is in our face now. They're not hiding it anymore. They're trying to normalize pedophilia. They're trying to, you know, take control of governments and everything. So, um, it, you know, we're it's in our face. So now we have a choice. So I feel like it's a judgment time where you just have to decide, am I going to do the right thing? The thing that does no harm per natural law. Mm -hmm. Or am I going to go along with the system because I'm scared of losing my job? I'm scared of people being mad at me. I'm scared of being censored. It's not easy, but there is always a choice. I mean, do you agree? Oh, absolutely. I've often told my children, if everybody, let's just say if everybody in the army refused to fight a war when the government yes. told them to go to war for no reason, there's nothing they could do. But it would take all of us standing together. Yep. And that's what it's going to take. It takes a certain number of us. It's that hundredth monkey syndrome, mm -hmm. you know, it, I, when there's a certain, I don't know what the percentage is, but a certain percentage of humanity that stands up and says, no, we're not going to tolerate 
I mean, there's no need for poverty or violence or war or scarcity or disease for that matter. These are all things done to control us, you know, to mm -hmm. make us, to fragment us because trauma fragments us. And that's the basis of mind control and like MK Ultra. You fragment and shatter the being, and then you reprogram them to do what you want them to do. And so, you know, they're using, we're creators, right? So, but we're being herded into creating a dystopia instead of creating a hell on a heaven on earth, we're being herded to create a hell on earth, right? Mm -hmm. And so we can say, no, that's not what I want to create. I want to create this, right? And so it's really that simple. It doesn't mean it doesn't have consequences in this reality, but if enough of us say no and don't follow the harmful requirements, whatever they are, that would change reality in and of itself. Yeah. So they're perpetrators, that's true. But do we need to be victims or can we say, no, I'm not willing, you know? And then we are more powerful. That's what I like to really say. We are way more powerful. The light is more powerful than the dark. So step into your power and use that power and say, I will not comply or do evil. I will not harm another living being. It's really, mm -hmm. that's natural law. It's really boils down to do no harm. Right. Well, Max, thank you so much for sharing your story and sharing your wisdom. The things that you've said today are so inspiring to me about taking back our power and standing together and refusing to participate in evil. I would like to give you a chance to share about the work that you're doing and about where the viewers can find you. Sure. Um, I uh, started a website called unbroken.global and um, I do interviews. So I interview other survivors. I found many of us are out there and, and coming up and telling our stories. I interview truth warriors. So people that spread the truth about all kinds of different things. And then I interview healers too, because uh, part of what I wanna do is offer people um, tools and ideas, how to come back from trauma, how to regain, you know, how to rise in consciousness. Um, and I do a series uh, called Inner Journey, where I talk about the inner things that we all go through, because I think the more we share who we really are in our struggles, this, this can help other people. So I do a lot of interviews. Um, I have a blog, so I'm, I write articles. And um, I will be putting out a course on trauma, which will include also satanic ritual abuse survivors. Um, and I'm going to be having some Q&A sessions coming up soon on my website. Um, and then my episodes are also on BitChute, um, on YouTube, except on YouTube, they're just uh, little trailers because they would censor my content there. Um, and, and then... Um, I believe I have a social media person. So I think I gave you a list so that people can see all the places they can find me. Um, but yeah, so that's me. Yes, and I will have all of those links in the description. Thank you again so much, Max. You're very welcome. Thank you for watching the Love Cover Life podcast. If you'd like to support this channel, I've shared the link to my Patreon in the description box where you can get benefits like behind the scenes of this podcast, early ad-free access to interviews, and a monthly live stream Q&A with me. I've also shared the link to my free Discord community, which I've just started and I'm very excited about where I share free resources and a bunch of channels and forums where people can connect and grow spiritually together. You'll also find the link to my website, lovecoveredlife.com, where I share my paintings, my TikTok and Instagram at Melissa Denise, and my clips channel where I share shorter clips of my podcast episodes. Thank you for watching and thank you for your support.